My name, my name is Henry Giroux, and I'm the co-director of the Center for uh, Scholarship in, in the Public Interest, and I'm here today to talk to uh, Brad Evans, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol, and he's also the founder and uh, director of the uh, uh, Project for uh, the History of Violence Project. And one of the reasons that we're here is we're in the midst of developing a partnership around a number of important issues that we think link or should link academic life to a series of public considerations. Uh, we find that in, in much of the literature that now is working in the public realm, and as opposed to literature in the academic realm, it's very difficult to bring these literatures together. It's very difficult often to be able to talk about what intellectuals should do outside of the kind of restricted institutional confines in which they find themselves. And this is important because it not only defines or it tends to limit the notion of what a public intellectual might be and what they might do, but it also tends to put a clamp and an enormous set of restraints on, on how we could imagine academic life in the university as being much different from what it is at the current time, which in our estimation is very restrictive. And so, Brad, I think one of the first things that I, I think we might do is, why don't you tell us about the, uh, the, the Histories of Violence Project and, and how it addresses some of those issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, the, the Histories of Violence Project, I think, really started, well, it emanated really out, of, out of sort of teaching experiences. And I was somebody who was really sort of very much versed in the continental political philosophical tradition. Um, and one of the big problems you have when you're you know, versed in that tradition is, you know, how do you stop yourself becoming part of this abstract esoteric machine which talks to itself? Um, and what I found particularly with, you know, you can't lie to students. Students get this, you know. They either, yeah, you know, yeah, they, there's right. nothing to, you know, if, if, if it's not meaningful to them, then they won't bother. Right. Um, so if you can't sell it to the student, then how the hell are you going to sell right. it to a wider general public? Yeah. Um, but the one thing I found gradually through teaching was, you know, rather than just giving students a book on Derrida or Foucault and Deleuze and just throwing them into it and saying, okay, well, how do you deal with this? I started teaching the, the text and the courses in the context of an important problem, which is the problem of violence. And then you can start unpacking and say, well, actually, these intellectual critical scholars have something important to say about this sort of different topic area. Now, it was from that experience, really, that I started thinking, well, wouldn't it be great if I just brought together a whole load of great academics who could provide basic introductory lectures on the relevance of these key intellectual figures, past and present, on the problematic of violence? And it started, I guess, to give birth from that. And the more it started to develop, and I started to realise, I guess, the power of you know, what multimedia could do as an educational tool in terms of, I'm not saying displacing conventional academia, but supplementing and reinforcing, adding value to already existing academic tools. That it started, the project started to really take on a life of its own. And before we knew it, you know, I was engaging with a lot of public cultural organisations. We were developing a whole series on, you know, the ten, to coincide with the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And that, I guess, you know, the, it indicated to me the fact that it did almost take on a life of its own, that we were onto something important and something, you know, worth pursuing and something worth developing. Now, at the heart of this project, to me, again, is another, you know, whereas violence is, seems to be the central problematic, it's a much more, I guess, wider issue of critical pedagogy and how do we deal with the problematic of violence. Now, if you, of course, if you come at the problematic of violence from the discipline which I've conventionally come at, which is politics, um, you wrap this up into nar narratives of sovereignty, state power, state right, violence, right. and that seems to be it. You right. know. Um, whereas we're meant to be living in this age of transdisciplinary engagement. And the one thing, I guess, which, you know, dealing with the continental philosophy, thankfully, did encourage me to do was to think in transdisciplinary terms. Um, so, you know, once you start opening this up, then, well, you know, of course, if you deal with the problematic of violence, you can't simply deal with it in sovereign terms. Right. You have to deal with it in aesthetics, deal with it in terms of literature, deal with it in poetry. But, but, but even, yeah. around the, even around the question of sovereignty. Uh, yeah, completely. I mean, the question yeah. of sovereignty gets completely reworked. I mean, it's, mm. it seems to me in, in an age in which corporations now assume, mm. once, once assume the power that states often have had in the past. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. But the, the problem with political academies is they reverted back to this old typology of sovereignty as law and it's a very reductionist yeah. sort of narrative in that sense um, and the one thing which I found particularly compelling you know is that well, whereas people who deal with this you know this very critical pedagogical approach can sometimes be marginalized within the academy as being somehow devoid from reality when you speak to cultural organizations they get it 
Yeah. You know, it's not a difficult sell. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and you know whether I was speaking to on a local level in you know when I was working in the city of Leeds to Opera North, who were great, they really bought into the idea, or even to the Guggenheim in New York. You know, they really bought into the idea very clearly, very you know because they got it. And then it raises questions. Well, actually, who's out of touch? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's very interesting because uh, for somebody who is interested in starting a center here at, at McMaster mm -hmm. University, uh, there are a lot of similar questions that haunt in some way the absences that I want to address that I think the center might in some way take up. Mm. I mean, absences that in some way are very disturbing about not just simply right-wing politics, but also left-wing politics. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that has been very clear to me in the last 35 years in which I've been writing is that, first of all, questions of youth are left out of, often left out of the category of oppressive groups. You know, so there's this absence around young people that it seems to me really needs to be addressed. I mean, if young people represent the future, uh, generations that mark the future, and you're going to talk about hope in the future, what does it mean to leave them out? Mm. But that led to something else. And, and what it led to was that it seems to me that young people basically also suggest something that you've talked about, the need to make something meaningful, to make it critical, to make mm. it transformative. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, that's a pedagogical equation mm. that actually puts pedagogy at the center of politics. Mm -hmm. It puts it at the center of politics. It doesn't mm. marginalize it. And if we can't talk, talk to people in ways in which we can bring to bear our intellectual resources and our intellectual skills so as to make those resources meaningful, Mm. and critical mm. in ways that both unsettle their own common sense assumptions, but at least give them the tools to believe or the passion to believe that knowledge mm. matters, mm -hmm. that it matters, that you can operate in an institution like the university and do work that isn't so es esoteric, so individualized, mm. so utterly specialized. And it's, there's, there's certainly room for that work, but that's not the only kind of work that should be prioritized or should be done. Mm -hmm. But there is the question of what is the responsibility of intellectuals here, mm -hmm. you know, in both basically taking on these kinds of challenges. And for mm -hmm. me, I wanted to use the center as a way to, in some way, imitate, emulate, and extend some of the work you're doing. I mean, mm -hmm. we believe that uh, if, if we're going to have a center to do this work, then we've got to rethink mm -hmm. the, the, both the role of the intellectual and in, in terms of how they address uh, complex social problems through a language that's theoretically rigorous and accessible. Not one that compromises theory and not one that sort of degenerates into mere journalism, mm. the most stupid kind of journalism, but one that suggests something about knowledge that's engaged, mm -hmm. rigorous and engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an enormous uh, uh, audience out there, but there's a second issue. And the second issue is, look, both in England and the United States, higher education is under siege in a big way. It's under siege, of course, by, by the, the forces of, 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 of finance. It's under siege by the billionaires who want to privatize. And it's under siege by a public that doesn't understand what we do. I mean, they've been, they, they've been sort of infected, if I may, with the idea that we need to show practical results. We need to show, you know, we, we need to somehow hook into an economy that, for instance, trains workers. So they, they cling to a very limited notion of uh, uh, instrumentality around defining the role of the university. And yet we have, I mean, if any group should be defending the public nature of the university in much broader terms, talking about its value uh, for, for raising the consciousness of young people, educating them to be engaged citizens, to take questions of risk, critical thinking seriously, to in some way understand there's a connection between what they're doing in the university and everyday life, that they can actually be educated in ways in which they not only become critical, but become engaged. They learn how to be, not only how to be governed, but how to govern. Mm -hmm. They learn these skills. It seems to me that if we can't defend that, if, 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 if these academics who are trapped in these utter specializations and these, what we might call these isolated pockets of academic obtuseness, if they can only defend themselves, then they can't, e can't even defend the conditions for their own work. Mm. This is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. They can't even defend the conditions for their own labor mm. to a wider mm. public. That will basically shut them down. Mm. They will shut them down. Mm. And we will lose the university mm. as a public sphere that is nothing more now or increasingly than an adjunct to corporate interest. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know, this raises uh, a number of important questions in terms of, you know, the, first of all, you know, what is a university? And do you think, you know, right. if you look back to the old, you know, formation of the university, you know, that the start of it was the humanities, right. and philosophy in particular. Right. Now, where is the room for philosophy when you impose a management culture on humanities? 
and I think that in itself is you know which is why you're witnessing a hollowing hollowing out, particularly in the UK, of you know closing down programs of critical philosophy, for instance, you know that seem to have no room within that management culture of the humanities. But there's, but there's an interesting issue there, right? I mean, I mean, for me, to, to close down those disciplines that in some way suggest what Derrida called the possibility to think mm -hmm. otherwise, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it suggests that the attack on public institutions is not merely an attack to increase the profit margins of corporations. It's also an attack to create the conditions or to, to completely destroy the conditions mm -hmm. that allow people to think critically about the nature of their lives that mm -hmm. they lead. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, so in a sense, these public spheres are not just attacked because they need to be privatized. Mm. I mean, they're also attacked because they're one of the few spheres left mm. actually where the kind of thinking takes place mm. that could you know, offer alternative narratives mm. to the lives that people lead. Now, just one example in the US. I mean, you know, Arizona, that bastion of uh, emancipatory politics, uh, uh, has actually banned, right? I mean, uh, 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 Chicano uh, literature. I mean, and, and the, the uh, teaching by you know the, the, the what is it the Mexican Mexican uh, Mexican American uh, courses. I mean, actually ban them. They cannot teach diversity courses in Arizona. Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, just wipe them out. Yeah. Or in Florida, where they claim that at the secondary at the secondary level, you could social science teachers could teach history, but they cannot interpret it. They were, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, there was a law saying you cannot interpret these things. I mean, these are rather bold face mm -hmm. sort of examples of something that's going on that is about more than anti-intellectualism. It's mm -hmm. about destroying the formative cultures that make a democracy possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's, an, it's an, I think, an, you know, a deep, you know, in this very simplest form, an attack on the political. What is the political if not the ability to think otherwise? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. And, and, and equally, you know, and what I find really perverse about this, you know, is the, the, particularly this management culture, and it really is, you know, part of this, this UK system where you have this, you know, this ranking of universities and ranking of individual academics, you know, and the management culture, of course, imposes deadlines now, you know, you need to produce X amount of research in X amount of time, you know. How would, you know, people such as Karl Marx ever wrote to Das Kapital <laughs> saying, you know, you've got a three-year deadline. But even, not even just Karl Marx, you know, you, you imagine, you know, even the great luminaries of contemporary liberal thinking, Friedrich von Hayek, you know, somebody imposed a management deadline on him before he wrote the road to serfdom, which, whatever it is, politics, is a damning, a great damning indictment of Nazism. But, but, you know, you know, it's, it's very interesting because what you have in that management logic is really the politicization of time mm. in, in a way that we've never seen before, mm -hmm. meaning that you now have time, if I may, as corporate time and public time, right? Mm -hmm. Corporate time is time that is excessively sped up. Mm -hmm. Doesn't give you time to think. Operates off an efficiency map, mm -hmm. a model. Get it done as quickly as you can in order to boost profits or whatever, you know, boost statistics. Where public time is, is slow time. It's Ray Charles mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to slow, slow the melody down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's room for thoughtfulness. You know, there's room for some kind of dialogue. There's room for an exchange. Mm -hmm. There's room for, if anything, listening to the narrative of the other. Mm -hmm. Being a witness, mm -hmm. right? Public times allows you to be a witness. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it seems to me that the deeply depoliticizing gesture that this notion of time incorporates is systemic. I mean, it's not, it's not simply something that's a byproduct of the model, right? I mean, this is not to suggest that public time doesn't exist for the, for the, for, for the financial elite in some places. It exists in their private schools. Mm -hmm. Nobody speeds up time at Yale. <laughs> Nobody's speeding up time, at, 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 believe me, at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. They have all the time they need. Mm -hmm. But put but talk about public universities that are now under assault around this issue. Talk about you know smaller community colleges which are now high schools with ashtrays. Mm -hmm. That's what they basically are training centers, mm -hmm. right? Talk about the substitution of education training for education, mm -hmm. or all the language that we know that we both know mm -hmm. that th these management business cultures employ. So it, it seems to me again there is something interesting pedagogically going on mm -hmm. in that if pedagogy constitutes the threat. Mm -hmm. that the right or various fundamentalisms are afraid of because nobody wants a questioning subject. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. So the pedagogies that produce that are dangerous. But if you start separating out and you destroy the institutions that make that possible, and then you look at the conditions at the same time that assist in making that possible, mm -hmm. they get eliminated. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it begins to make sense, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. And also, I think, you know, looking and bringing it back to, you know, I think this is what I find, you know, um, quite very much exciting about the collaboration we could possibly you know, we can work through together is that 
First of all, it raises it puts you know if we put critical pedagogy at the forefront of thinking about the political, right? Which is you know which seems right. to be absolutely central, right? Yeah. Um, but also then it raises much broader questions about what is the role of the intellectual or the right. public intellectual right. in contemporary societies, and and indeed you know because of the conditions that you we operate we're both operating in, whether it's in the UK or in you know the US, it's a question then of yeah okay you know how do we function ethically? Right. With, and live with ourselves as academics right. and yeah. and you know without being giving crude sort of you know subjectifications to different academics you know I think you can identify a number of key types of academic right. which you know they're, they're, first of all there's the obvious ones who are seduced by power right. and we should forever remain deeply suspicious of those right. you know the embedded academics who allow us to do war better right. commit state violence better we can put those to a side but I think within the, the leftist discourse there is a, there's a whole you know a range of complex sort of academics and there's the ones which mean you've talked you know at length already about of you know who exist for their own universe yeah. and and those are the types of academics who become yeah. very prescriptive they tell the world how the world should be and they almost stun you into intellectual submission where is the dialogue in that yeah. where is the room for you know how does that reflect to the everyday person on the street who appreciates the raw they you know they appreciate the raw ends of power and, what, and I think what these th those type of academics always fail to accept for me is that, you know, you look at the great political moments throughout history, most of those people have never probably picked up a political theory book in their lives. Yeah. You know, um, you know Rosa Parks or, you know, even the Zapatistas of Mexico. You know, these people who make profound political changes, they don't require some universal moral theorist to authenticate what they do. And I think sometimes the task for us as critical theorists is certainly to be affirmative, but also to basically provide a more, I guess, rigorous history of our present and yeah. to open up history to different narratives. And when, as soon as you do that, you do understand it's complex and it's, you know, it's very well, contested. I, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, taking off on, on, that, on that analysis, what's so interesting about that is that you're not talking about intellectuals, who, in this case, who are merely seduced by money. Hmm. You're talking about intellectuals who, who are seduced by their own self-interest, you know, by a sense of moral purity, hmm. by a kind of fundamentalism in which Actually, it's an orthodoxy that, even though its content is different from an orthodoxy on the right, it actually shares something much greater, mm -hmm. a kind of willingness to believe that there are always guarantees mm -hmm. and that you'll provide them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's, I find those kinds of intellectuals, and there are a lot of them on the left in the United States, in my estimation, mm -hmm. to be enormously repulsive uh, mm -hmm. in that they, they, they actually, as you would suggest, they... They, they, they actually engage in a form of anti-political behavior mm. in that they destroy the realm of politics. Politics is not possible within that realm mm. because there's no dialogue. There's no exchange, right? Mm. There's only one way. Mm. Uh, there's a certain rigidity. They operate in circles of certainty that close down the possibility of this kind of human unfolding, mm -hmm. which it seems to me without being, you know, silly in terms of the humanistic discourse, but actually is something that should be at the center of any politics, the mm -hmm. ability to move forward. I mean, Bauman has an expression about how, what is a, what is a just society? He says, it's a society that's never just enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that one can argue, what is an intellectual who matters? An intellectual who's always willing to not only interrogate the world they find around themselves, but actually interrogate themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the question of self-analysis as opposed to social mm -hmm. analysis should actually mutually reinforce each other. Mm -hmm. And it's in the absence of that, mm -hmm. that you know, one often finds, as you're suggesting, intellectuals who are so ideologically crippled mm. by virtue of their willingness to consistently either perform, mm. right, mm. or to simply interview themselves. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a constant narrative that, mm. that, that, that doesn't change. Mm. It, it doesn't have an audience. Mm. It has a mirror. Mm. We trace out, you know, some of, the, some of the key critical thinkers who've contributed, I think, you know, very affirmatively to our way of thinking about what it means to be political. Right. And I think if we run through, particularly, you know, the, say, the trajectory from, from Michel Foucault to Zygmunt Bauman, right. I think one of the principal messages in their work is how do you stop becoming, you know, how do you overcome your own tendency to willfully capture yourself? You know, yeah, you know how do you sort yeah, of you know you know how do you you know how do you stop yeah, that you know I love that, that, yeah, that, that yeah. self-imposed yeah. fascism you know yeah. you, you are you know yeah. I am and it's this hyper moralism as you say which yeah. permeates not just you know the right discourse but the leftist Absolutely. discourse as well you know the, and then this claim to universally authenticate the meaning of everything the grand theory of everything you know and I think that's something which you know it becomes very humble if you're as an academic to say well actually sometimes I just don't know yeah. or sometimes actually. I might have been wrong. Or sometimes, you know, well, actually, I did think this then, but 
But actually, we're in a different political moment. So these things just don't apply now, you know. And it's the specificity of thinking politically, which requires perhaps you know, a lot more humbleness, but more sophisticated, you know, attention to the detail. Sometimes the more micro-specific details. I mean, there, 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 really, there are really two kinds of issues here that strike me as crucial around this kind of public intellectual work that we're talking about, right? I mean, one is the ability to, to in, in a sense, uh, understand totalities without being rigid. You know, do I understand how things connect? As you would say, you know, you know, echoing, you know, what you said, citing Foucault. You know, this. How do you understand the history of the present, right? How do you do that? I mean, how how do you now not only situate, you know, specific issues to broader public context, but how do you situate them in relational understandings of, of the past? How do how do the, how do these things become dynamic and ever changing resources that you have to mine? And I think that often what we find in the university is a type of intellectual who is so averse to that. Mm -hmm. so specialized, I mean, so insular mm -hmm. in the kind of research that they do, mm -hmm. uh, that you can't help but at times think that it, it, it's, it's another dangerous path towards a kind of inflated self-interest, mm -hmm. you know, that people find themselves. I'm an expert in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then on the other side, I mean, it, out, outside of this question of totality and the ability to be a broad intellectual, I mean, to, to operate in multiple kinds of, kinds of spheres, th there's, there's also this, this question of the refusal to recognize that you have to speak to multiple groups about these issues, that, mm -hmm. that there's a pedagogical imperative here. Mm -hmm. And that is, as we've said earlier, and, and certainly you do in your work, it's fantastic. I mean, which is to find the, the multiple modes of representation mm -hmm. through which you can reach multiple audiences with three things at work, it would seem to me as absolutely crucial criteria, right? It has to be meaningful in order to be critical. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you, it has to be both rigorous and it has to be accessible. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it has to address issues that seem to matter, mm -hmm. you know, that really have some urgency in the world in which we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, it has to be done with humility. Mm -hmm. There has to be the possibility of not ending the conversation, but opening it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, I, I do think, you know, that, um, and. You know, don't get me wrong, I'm not in any way saying that critical and sometimes complex theory is important because the world is complex. Oh, you know, and but the one thing I find is that you know if you can make this, you know, I, you have numerous colleagues who basically say, well, don't teach, teach the students this because they won't get this. You know, or you know, and you know, and I think you know, there's that's, nothing, that's that's nothing, terrible. yeah, there's nothing, that, yeah. there's nothing that a student likes more than being intellectually challenged. Right. You know, but it has to be meaningful and it has to relate to something which they can relate to. And, and, and equally, perhaps it's not imposing the meaning of the text to them. It's just to present it in a way which becomes, okay, well, this is the problematic. How can we relate to this? And how does that relate to the meaning of your lives? Because I think, you know, the one thing I always try to say to students is, you know, you know everything we do, you're the empirical object for this. And if it doesn't make sense to you, then forget about it. Yeah. You, know, as, you know, as Foucault and Deleuze said in their correspondence, you know, theory is like a box of tools. It's a, yeah. it's a resource. It's a resource. It's a resource. If you know, we, we're not here to authenticate anybody. No, we're not no, here to canonize no, nobody. No, no I, I mean, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that I find very troubling, you know, is that you know, you don't theory doesn't become a toolbox. It becomes a mode of theoreticism. Mm -hmm. It becomes it becomes an end in itself. Mm. I am this. Yeah. I'm I'm a Foucauldian. I mm. mean, Foucault would have been horrified to hear that. Yeah. It's yeah. outrageous. I mean, what is what do I have to offer you that makes sense? Yeah. In, in under the changing conditions in which you find yourself, mm -hmm. you know, in what way does the specificity of the events that bear down on your life, mm -hmm. in what way can this theory offer something to you? Theory isn't something that solves the problem. It's something that you use to try to figure it out, yeah. and then figure out what's available in that theory to be used. Mm -hmm. But, I, but I, I think the other side of this, and I, I think you've just mentioned something that absolutely needs to be clarified in the strongest terms. The claim that you can be rigorous and accessible at the same time mm -hmm. is not to make a claim for anti-intellectualism. It's not to make a claim for, dis for denouncing theory. It's not to make a claim for not raising the bar as high as possible. And it is not a claim to make, it, it certainly does not suggest that you teach your students to be stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, not to be able to confront challenging texts. Mm -hmm. But I don't care what they confront mm -hmm. in, in terms of the resources that we bring to them. If we can't make those resources somehow meaningful to those students so they can embrace them, not simply as a way to get a grade, mm -hmm. but as a passion for understanding both their lives, their relationships to others, and the larger society, we have failed as academics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In my mind, mm -hmm. we have failed. Mm -hmm. We have failed pedagogically, but most important, we have failed politically because we are not now helping to produce the conditions that enable them 
to think about the world that they want to live in in ways that might far surpass anything we could say to them. Mm, absolutely, and that's why prescription always fails. Because, it fails. Because I, you I know, know terms. well, you know, and I think you know, um, you know, I've, I've seen some stuff with Simon Critchley. I think Simon said a great thing. You know, all questions about the future are stupid. Yeah. Yeah. In so much as you know, and in so much as if you try to be prescriptive in a political in way to you know, because I've got no idea how brilliant my students could become. Yeah. And and I think that's part of the you know the, the humbling process that you have to take on board as an academic. And I like nothing more than you know speaking to students and saying, well, use my ideas, and then saying to me, well, actually, I fundamentally disagree with you. Yeah. I think, well, actually, finally, I'm doing something right. Yeah. You know, there's there's this sense, well, actually, you know, no, I'm going to challenge you. Um, I mean, I I think there's something particularly unsaid about academics who, th who are theoretically correct, or think they're theoretically correct, but are really pedagogical terrorists. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I mean, who, who don't mm -hmm. see the tension between what it means to be absolutely sure that what you're saying is, is worthwhile, mm -hmm. and maybe, but to do it in a context pedagogically that humiliates students, mm -hmm. that shuts them down, mm -hmm. that silences them, mm -hmm. that refuses to take any kind of feedback from them, but most importantly, as you know, mm -hmm. one of my mentors said, Paulo Freire, uh, refuses to learn from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what it means to be political in the mm -hmm. best sense of the term and not believe that there's so much out there to be learned by virtue of the people you interact with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To believe that you have the only narrative, mm -hmm. that there's no other narrative, that you're saving this missionary sort of imperative that sort of fuels so many academics that they would never make a claim to, mm -hmm. but in practice actually reproduce, mm -hmm. is really alarming. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm always concerned about the ways in which a kind of neoliberal ideology mm -hmm. sort of gets reproduced in under a radical discourse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, for example, I mean, the atomization that is at the center of neoliberal discourse. We're alone. We ultimately bear the price for all we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to assume individual responsibility for everything. You know, communal relationships represent forms of dependency that are like a poison. Uh, we can't count on those. And yet you see academics mm -hmm. acting in, in that mode mm -hmm. in ways mm -hmm. that are not unlike the kind of market identities mm -hmm. that are being pushed out by the Wall Street Journal every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and then it, it comes down to this, you know, well, you know, if you talk briefly about, you know, um, you talk about the relationship between the academic and the student, you know, and this becomes, you know, what we're really talking about, of course, is intellectual violence. That, yeah, that sort of, you know, that, that sort of right. sense of, you know, well, actually, I'm going to tell you exactly how things are. And that I'm, you know, this is the way the world is. And, you know, we can, you know, with no names mentioned, a certain well-renowned philosopher talks about, you know, the politics of a truth. You know, yeah. I have this a truth. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, you know, and it's I'm going to... It's discourse. Yeah. And I have this fidelity to the truth as much as, and you are, none of you, you know, if you don't follow me, then, you know, you're all wrong. You know, so you all might as well become spectators I mean, to I mean, my... You wonder how he or she would distinguish themselves from Pinochet. Hmm. I mean, because mm -hmm. basically all authoritarian logics make the same claim, right? Mm -hmm. I have the truth, you follow me, and in the most authoritarian societies, mm -hmm. we just cut your legs off if you don't. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Or cut your hands off or put you in prison for 100,000 years. I mm -hmm. mean, it, but, but I think the other side of this, I mean, there's, there's also another trajectory that you and I have explored that you have really, in my mind, pioneered in a, in a just uh, fabulous way. I mean, it, it's not just the question of, although this is truly important in your project, you know, of, of mining really mining these fabulous intellectuals to come in and, and to actually re-educate them in some ways about what it means to, te to be, be in a pedagogical situation, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to talk to publics that basically are not specialists in their fields, mm -hmm. you know, and to do it in ways that are, compa that are passionate and deal with important public issues. But the other issue here is the way in which this notion of the public intellectual and the projects that we both share and are going to work together on uh, it, it's 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 also about expanding the very meaning of education in the places where it takes place, mm -hmm. because it seems to me that up until the 1960s, when you talked about education, you basically talked about universities, mm -hmm. you basically talked about secondary schools, mm -hmm. but now you have to talk about the educational force of the entire culture, mm -hmm. which, in my estimation, is a far more powerful force mm -hmm. for education at the level of everyday life, particularly mm -hmm. for young people, mm -hmm. particularly for young people. Mm -hmm match that now with the emergence of these new technologies mm -hmm. that all of a sudden have completely rewritten the script between print and visual culture, first mm -hmm. of all, mm -hmm. opened up a vast array of new audiences, made interdisciplinary work really possible 
in multiple places. And now, for the most part, we have found ways through that technology, certainly as you've illustrated, mm -hmm. to cross national boundaries, mm -hmm. you know, to mobilize intellectuals around projects mm -hmm. that basically offer, through these new technologies, all kinds of possibilities. And, I, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll give you one example as, as a personal story in my own life. And it, 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 I hope this comes out right. But, you know, when I started writing for Truth Out, which is a, an online um, magazine journal that was basically doing lots of news stories. And, so, and I, I said to them, look, we need to create something called a public intellectuals project, right, of that sort, mm -hmm. of the sort that we, you know, we were doing at McMaster under Grace Pollock, right, already. And I said, we, because we, we, there really is an audience out there for academics who can write to a broader public, but write longer papers, you know, and, and try to address these issues in some depth. They said, oh, I, we don't know, we're not sure. I started that project. I started writing for it. A number of intellectuals, Stanley Aronowitz, a number of people started writing for it. Every piece we put in went to the top of the most popular list. Every piece we got in was getting like 20,000, 30,000 hits a week. Mm -hmm. A week. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine this intellectual who writes, this academic mm -hmm. who writes this chapter for an edited book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been in publishing for 35 years. Mm -hmm. I know what edited book sells. Mm -hmm. An edited book, if it sells 500 copies, is considered a major bestseller. Mm -hmm. 500 copies over five years. Mm -hmm. Five years. Mm -hmm. So you put a piece there. You're lucky if you get 500 readers in five years. You go into the, you expand into this new media, which not only offers opportunities outside of the dominant media, mm -hmm. but what it does to expand your audience. Mm -hmm. And it's almost addictive for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I mean, I get people writing to me now and they say, look, will you do, do an original piece for a, an edited book? I say, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I say, why would I do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I write that. It goes in, 250 people read it. You know, I said, you want to take something I've written already? Fine. I have no trouble. Use it, replicate it. But I don't do it. I don't do it because I, I actually think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mode of interaction that's dying mm -hmm. in yeah. some ways, mm -hmm. you know. But yet the traditional institutional forms that legitimate it mm -hmm. are so powerful. Mm -hmm. When you go up for tenure and you say, I've got 50 articles on Truth Out. Mm -hmm. I have editors who read those articles. They reject pieces all the time. I actually think they're smarter than my academic peers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the reviewers who have re reviewed a lot of my work in academic journals actually often seem so filled with resentment that I, I barely get feedback that I think is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. But when I work in this modality, the feedback I get is often stunning. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the, you know, one of the experiences I, I found is in terms of, you know, the, in particular with the violence project is that, you know, pe the first thing you get is that people who are actually not in conventional educational institutions. That's right. And not right. stupid. They want, they want, right. they want, they want access to this. They're, they're cultural producers. Yeah, they, 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 the they, they, they want, they want yeah. access to this thing. And now, I, I guess, you know, I'm fortunate enough now to be in a department which, you know, respects critical thinking. And that's, you know, that's great, despite all the challenges that universities face. But the one, in, you know, I guess drive, which I really wanted for the violence project, and this is one of the stipulations I've always said, you know, that the material on there has to remain free of copyright. It has to be openly accessible, that's right, that's and right, but the one thing which is great then, you know, when you look at the analysis of the statistics, you know, we, we you know, in tens of thousands of you know regular vi uh, visitors now from over 120 countries, um, but the, when I break down the, the viewer base, and this is one of the big brother, the, the advantages of Big Brother, a large, you know, the greater percentage of the users of our website are not from academic yeah. profiles. Yeah. Yeah. So Same there's a demand that. for this. Same for true. In, you know, in, in the public sphere. Right. Where people, you know, genuinely want to go and understand some of the complex, rigorous debates which are taking place there, right. and that in itself, I, I find, is you know, we need to open our, ourselves up to that and understand. Well, you know, and we're still unaware of this, and we have this separation where the, the university sector is becoming increasingly more and more privatized. Yeah. You know, where does the you know the, the the public wants to make sense of this stuff, and they they don't buy all the stuff which the newspaper simply put out as this manufactured. Right reality. You know? No, I, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the term here is that we need to reimagine what universities mean as real democratic public spheres, mm -hmm. you know, as, as places that provide intellectuals and provide scholarly work and bring intellectuals together from a wide variety of places and disciplines inside and outside of the university to engage in common projects that in some ways speak to what it means to link what we know to uh, both understanding the world and potentially changing it. I mean, I think that's a project that's worth fighting for. And I, I think what's so sad, at least in the United States, and I'm not sure the degree to which this works in England, in the United Kingdom, but I think the, the sad thing in the United States is that the right has always taken culture very seriously. Mm. You know, they, they, the culture wars, but they've done it by recognizing that the university is not the only place where you can back, actually educate your intellectuals. 
-hmm. So what do they have? They have all these foundations. They have, you know, I mean, the, these, these kind of think tanks all over the country that are producing these endless anti-public intellectuals, intellectuals who, as Bourdieu said, you know, are fast talkers, right? Mm -hmm. they, they talk in, uh, you know, in cliches and they get on and somebody gives them a complex question and they, they give a, you know, a 10 second answer because, you know, you can't go beyond 15 seconds, right? And, and, and it seems to me that, but they're versed. They're versed. They're being educated to do this. And we have nothing comparable here on the left. The only thing we have left in the United States, basically, is a university. You know, the university was one of the few places where in the 1960s, after the 60s, all these all people, people my age all migrated to the university because it was one of the few places where we could actually do what we needed to do to engage the ideas that we thought were, were worthwhile. But now with this new technology mm -hmm. and now with these new public spheres opening up, you know, and all kinds of possibilities for producing and distributing knowledge and also soliciting it from non-academics and not just academics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is a brave new world mm -hmm. in the best sense. Mm -hmm. You know, that opens up possibilities that I think both of these projects uh, uh, I, I hopefully will do very well in both addressing and mm -hmm. taking up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also I think, you know, the um, certainly, you know, when um, I speak to sort of your colleagues in the United States of America, I'm, I'm not saying that the British education system is anywhere as under crisis as what the American system seems to be. Um, but it's getting there. You know, th 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 there's, there's an assault yeah. at the moment, and it's a neoliberal assault on the UK education system. Yeah. Now, the impact is very uneven. You know, you've got some universities who have bought into it, and the polite intellectual violence which takes place within certain departments within certain universities is very evident yeah. you know and you have to speak to a number of you know of academics in the uk and they will tell you exactly the same story other universities are still holding on and fighting on to you know there's something fundamental to a university for any concept of civil society yeah um yeah. who's going to win that battle yeah only time will tell you know yeah. but uh, as you say in terms of you know this yourself as an academic then you know if you, you can either play the game, which will become almost like a Nietzschean will to nothingness, which is nihilism in the best sense, or in the worst sense, sorry, or you can say, well, okay, well, how can I respond to this? And I think the best way to respond to it is by creating your own network of like-minded academics. And the great joy of multimedia technologies today is you don't have to be geographically bounded. Yeah. You know, you can, you know, and that was one of the great, you know, things which I really found with, you know, starting up the violence project. It allowed me to get into touch with, you know, a lot of academics who I'd already admired and to create this really vibrant network of academics who I think are in it for all the right reasons, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it's the right reasons is to basically, well, can we think the world otherwise? Yeah. Yeah. Can we think the world differently? Yeah. And that, to me, has to be the guiding inspiration or else why are we in academia in the first place? I mean, I, I'm, I mean I'm convinced that if this war on post-secondary education is lost, uh, it'll be decades before we see any vestige of democracy again. I mean, I, mm. I, I, you cannot rely on the dominant media. You, we have to ask ourselves where these intellectuals are going to come from, who basically are going to do the hard work of addressing the kinds of problems that, that you know, you've addressed. Um, and while if we don't fight for the university, then who does? Mm. Who does? I mean, certainly right now it's not the public, because mm -hmm. the public's not convinced that the universities are even doing the most instrumentalist of jobs, mm -hmm. which is providing people for with the training they need to get decent jobs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, it seems to me the project at hand here has never been so urgent mm -hmm. and has never been so necessary mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm.